Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Romance Happy Hour. I'm Dylan Crush, and I'm here with Dawn and Amanda and Sharon. And we're all super excited to be sharing our Thursday evening with you. Um, go ahead and let Dawn introduce herself and tell us what she's been working on. I'm Dawn. Uh, I have been working on a... Um, contemporary lighthouse book um and i'm about 60 percent of the way done which is great because oh that's good progress weeks ago so um and uh, then after that I'm, I'm gonna be starting the second book in my contemporary indie series that i'm going to be launching later this year um so i gotta write flynn's book and I'm very excited to write him because he is a player. <laughs> what about you, Dylan? What are you working on? I just finished the second book in my new Lovebird Cafe series last weekend, and I'm sending that off to the editor. So that's pretty exciting. And right now I'm working on a project that my agent has out on submission. So maybe, maybe good news will come from that eventually at some point. Um, so yeah, been keeping busy. And then my first indie book, um, Sweet Tea and Second Chances is launching on April 26th. So if you didn't mention that, I was just going to say, yeah, you just read it. <laughs> yes. Right. I made Dawn suffer through it last week. Too. No, I didn't suffer. Like I, I was mad. I didn't like, say that. I know. I should not say that. I have four kids, so they never let me read. So they'd be interrupting <laughs> me, and I'd be like, I'm trying to read this. That's why I got my bath caddy, if you guys. Uh, oh, watch. yeah. Let's not talk about the bath caddy again. <laughs> Your mom's on now. Let's not talk about the bath caddy. It works, though. Like, <laughs> kids, kids, books, bubbles. Mine. Dawn's mom joins us when she has a chance so it's always fun yeah. we always get all kinds of good stories about Dawn when her mom is on so. Yeah. <laughs> so and we have Amanda and Sharon with us Amanda would you go ahead and introduce yourself and and tell everybody kind of what you write and what you've been working on sure so I'm Amanda Yule and I write both paranormal romance as well as contemporary romance and I'm currently working on one of each because I like to <laughs> kill myself <laughs> and I can't work on one project at the same time so I actually have a contemporary um, book called Sweet Stuff. I'm about halfway through that uh, novel and then I have a paranormal called Healing Kiss and I am probably about a quarter of the way through that and I kind of go back and forth between the two but the hope is to get those complete this year and then off to the publisher. So how do you split your time on those? Do you work on one in the morning and one in the afternoon or? No, because I have switch. a day job <laughs> as well. So no, I don't do that. But I just, when I get stuck on one a little bit, then I go to the other and, and you know, just try to move things along that way. Okay. I have different places interested in each. So I have different kind of deadlines on both. So. I have a really hard time just keeping track of one story. So I don't know how you do that. It's not very easy. impressive. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> I'd probably start calling all the characters the wrong names. Yeah. I've, I've noticed I'll even flip, like, because I write both in first person and third person, and the story that I was just working on, I would start one chapter in third person, and halfway through, I'd flip to first. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I don't know. If I was trying to write two books at once, I'd probably have all of the heroes and heroines you know, mixed up. Uh, Part of the reason I do that is because a paranormal novel is really hard to write. It's a fantasy world versus mm -hmm. the contemporary is much easier. So that's what happens. I get a little stuck on the paranormal, you know, yep. the plot and trying to figure things out. And then I go to the contemporary because it's much, you know, faster, simpler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, right. Well, very cool. How about you, Sharon? Um, so I write romantic suspense, young adult and women's fiction. But right now, I am completely focused on the romantic suspense books. Um, and I write romantic suspense um, stories right now that are, they're ex-Green Berets, and they're retelling Shakespeare's greatest love stories. Oh, so, awesome. Um, each book is a redemption or retelling, with a happily ever after, obviously, of, um, of the different couples. But it's very 
light, like it's not heavy handed. So it's, but it's, you know, thematic retellings as my editor likes to say. So that's, um, but they're very much like puzzle books. They're very much like National Treasure, Dan Brown, where there's adventure, okay. a lot of adventure, a lot of action, a lot of intersecting pieces, a lot of characters are usually told from four or five points of view. You know, so the hero and heroine and then a villain and then other people running around doing things. Um, and they're longer. They're um, my first book. I think is one hundred thirty-four thousand words. Wow. The second one coming out in September is I think one hundred twenty-five thousand. And the looks like the third book that is due next week is going to be about the same, about about one hundred twenty-five thousand words. So they're long. That's they're amazing. Long. Yep. But they're fun. Very long. They're they're great. They're I they're adventure stories. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of love and there's a lot of adult situations, but they're also high you know adventure stories. So they're fun to write. But yeah. they're all consuming. So I've put aside for my agent, the young adult, and the women's fiction for now. Okay. okay. So. Well, I am eager to hear about your process and everything when we yeah. get into your books. <laughs> yeah. You keep all those different threads straight and the puzzles and, and you know, all the that. The interesting thing is it's it's been different for every book. <laughs> <laughs> so when I come up with a process, I will let you know. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> Well, we have got um, Dawn made the drink for tonight, and I noticed you're not sipping your cowboy drink, are you, Dawn? Uh, I have had, so the last two weeks, my kids have had scarlet fever, so I've been super, super unexhausted. I don't have time to make drinks, so I'm sipping on wine in my margarita glass. Is it Gatorade tonight, or is it really wine? It's wine. It's real. She's making out last time <laughs> I, fake it. I fake it until i make it right that's what they used to call it to tell us at the spa <laughs> fake it well, I, I was gonna drink prosecco tonight but i still have to work after this so i'm drinking oh prosecco. shoot <laughs> and depending on how much prosecco you drink it, it can really you have to work day job stuff or writing stuff writing stuff because the book students okay. Okay. Right, drunk and edit sober, right? <laughs> it can influence, yeah, what ends up on the page, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I am sticking with my grapefruit vodka. I think um, yeah. I need to apply to Deep Eddie vodka as a spokesperson. Can you lift that up again? Because I know. Oh my gosh. Little tree. So it's my stir. Yep. I have a little yeah, stir in there. Oh, we match. Look at that. We didn't even plan it. Wow. Oh, no, we didn't. I have, I also have this. Don and I are <laughs> surprisingly just on this mind meld wonder twin power thing all the time. I'm going to figure out how to get her to write my books for me. I'm just going to send her <laughs> the signal. Good and luck then you can that. Send them back to me fully done. So are either one of you, well, Sharon, you said that you've got to work later. Did you bring a beverage tonight, Amanda? I did. I brought, I'm a big tea drinker, so I have my hot cinnamon spice tea in my Ooh, yum. Charm by Charlie mug for the occasion. And it's very good. Har that sounds good. Harney, Harney and Sons is the tea, tea brand. Okay. I am not uh, a very knowledgeable tea drinker. So, but I enjoy it. Yeah, when, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge tea fanatic, so I order this online. Um, it's a like a decaffeinated brand. And people always ask me, what is it? It's it's Harney and Sons. Uh, I think it's hot cinnamon spice. But it's okay, that good. sounds good. Hot cinnamon yeah. spice sounds good. Really good. Although I'm trying to bring spring to Minnesota by no longer drinking cocoa and things like that. <laughs> I, I've decided that maybe it's our fault because we're still, you know, wearing our flannel jammies and your <laughs> boots. And so, so I'm going for all in, spring. Are you going to go and just walk or start walking around in shorts and flip flops and maybe the weather will well, like I said, it was 40 today. We are forced to be reckoned with. We're going to change to sunshine and warm. It was 40 up. today. We went from expecting like 13 inches of snow last weekend, and then it didn't come. We only got maybe like four inches, um, and then it was 40 today. So yeah. it's, it's moving upward. It's moving right. in the right direction. Yeah. But I am leaving the tundra to head south for spring break with my kids. So yeah. I'm going to be in, in Texas the end of this month. 
Oh, that'll be wonderful. Looking forward to that. So I'll be I'll be heading up the broadcast for you, Rita. And I promise that um, I won't be tired of drinking. I'll just be drinking. <laughs> well, I'm still planning on being there. I just. No, she will. She'll be there. Yes, I'm, I'm still planning on being there. I just don't know where I will be. So. Right. <laughs> you can pull over to the side of the road if she's driving and just click right on there. I don't think we'll have to go to that kind of measures, but but we'll see. I just so, want to see the sun. I just want to see the sun. I know. I, I feel like we're all kind of going through this. Oh, and the past couple days has been incredibly foggy because we have, you know, like 12, well, not 12 feet. It feels like 12 feet. We've got about, you know, four feet of snow and then it was raining the past couple of days. So like this morning and yesterday, we visibility was maybe like maybe 50 feet. It was crazy. My mom so. that we've got your snow. So you must have sent it over Ooh. to Montana. Because they okay. I know she 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 Marco followed me um the other day. My my stepdad like hauling in wood on his back and it was like I think it dumped like what three feet of snow overnight, mom, something like that. Like she can have it. They don't want it. They she can keep it. They want to come back. <laughs> no, no, thank you. <laughs> All right, all right, enough about the weather. <laughs> yeah, we need to hear some some reading. So I think we decided that Amanda is going first, right? That's what yes. we said. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say Amanda's not moving, so <laughs> let's <laughs> she's pretending to be frozen so she doesn't have to go first. Just kidding. No, no. I liked I actually like to read out loud. So Oh good. You should come on every week. You can read everybody's because everybody always gets very nervous. No, I actually enjoy reading out loud. So this I'm gonna read. I thought I would read. I have two different books that I am giving away today, an e-cop e copy of each book. So I figured I would do a little reading from each book. Perfect. So this one is my paranormal. It is called Mind Waves. It's from the um, Mind Hacker series. So it's a series novel. Second book I have actually fully written. It's just being edited right now. Um, and so I'm just going to read from chapter one. And it's not a super long chapter. So hopefully I won't. I won't bore the listeners. <laughs> how I do. You tell me how I do. I don't think you'll bore us. I think that's why we're here. We're all excited to hear. So all right, I'm going to put you up solo. So oh, okay, we've got the full screen. All right. So whenever you're ready. Okay, so here we go. Chapter one, the interview, present day. Grace Wozniski was about to con the CEO of a billion dollar corporation, or at least omit one tiny but crucial detail. She took a minute to wipe her clammy hands on her skirt while staring at the shiny glass office building of Cleveland's Gallon Enterprises. The giant structure appeared cold and sleek, like the high-tech robotic parts manufactured there. Grace could not screw up this opportunity. Her bank account could not afford it. With a deep breath, she gathered her courage, and for at least the 20th time since she got out of bed this morning, rehearsed exactly what she would say to convince Bryce Gallant she was the woman for the design job. Grace was fortunate to have been granted an in-person interview, a favor orchestrated by her ex-husband, Greg, who had been high school pals with the CEO. Making her way through the double doors, she caught a glimpse of her reflection. The girl in the glass had short, short dark blonde hair, and filled out the skirt and jacket with curves in all the right places. She appeared confident and professional. At least she looked the part. Now, if only Bryce Gallant thought so too. Hello, she smiled at the receptionist who did not smile back. My name is Grace Wisniewski. I have a meeting with Mr. Gallant. She hated how her words came out, like she wasn't certain she had an appointment. Certainly, let me notify his assistant that you're here, have a seat. The receptionist indicated the black leather chairs in the waiting area. Grace did not remain seated for long. As promised, the assistant arrived to escort her to the elevator, which took her to a large conference room with windows overlooking a sleek landscape design in the shape of a robot next to a cascading waterfall. Make yourself comfortable. It will be a moment, the woman said. Grace had just sat in one of the sleek black chairs when the door opened widely and in strolled a heavy set and short gallant, followed by a small army. Grace had not expected such a large audience. 
She had only brought materials for five. A pleasure to meet you, Grace. I hope you don't mind I've invited a few others along. Gallant indicated his companions, three women and two men, but did not make any further introductions, leaving Grace guessing at their roles at the company. Not at all, she said. Thank you for giving me the chance to bid on the project. Of course, we're excited to see what you have to offer. The rotund Gallant waved one manicured hand toward her portfolio. Heard great things about you from Gregory Tilko. He reminded me you're a talented artist. We're looking for someone who can design the right artwork for our new building. The art we display is important to me since that's the first thing our employees and customers will see, which is why I've made it a point to personally meet with all those who are bidding on the project. Great, well, I'm eager to show you my ideas. Let's see what you got for us. He pulled out the largest chair at the head of the table and sat. The rest of the pack followed suit until every chair around the table was filled. That's when Grace noticed a third gentleman in the room. He must have been at the rear when the group entered, and so she had missed seeing him. His ebony hair gleamed under the fluorescent lights, and he took a seat slightly apart from the others, staring at his notebook with a stillness that stood out. Although he was not looking at her, Grace sensed he watched her carefully, and in fact was already making notations in his notebook. He turned his head toward her slightly to catch her staring his eyes stabbing into her like a mouse singled out by a dangerous predator. Maybe it was her imagination, but they seemed to glow from within like a cat in the night. His thick, glossy black hair contrasted dramatically with the chiseled lines of his face, which could have been carved from marble. She peeled her gaze away from his with some effort and pulled out her samples. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't expect such a large group. I only brought five packets. Hopefully some of you can share. Handing them out hurriedly, Grace began her presentation. Having spent long hours poring over design ideas to create the mock-up she was now showing, she knew it was some of her best work. The mural she would create with pieces of green, blue, and yellow beach glass she had gathered mostly on the Lake Erie shoreline would dominate the south wall of the main entrance of the building, rising like a giant wave to greet its visitors. The biggest issue was whether she could pull it off. The yellow glass she would need was rare, and since she worked alone, she would have to hire plenty of help to bring the design to life. Grace was also not sure she could get the pricing she had indicated, which was where she would fudge a little. Once she got the job, she would convince Bryce Gallant to up the budget slightly for materials. After showing them her proposal, Grace was concluding her speech when she was interrupted by the intense man with the notebook. How do you propose to obtain that much beach glass for your design? One of the colors you have specified is rare. His question threw her off, given Grace had the same thought only minutes before. She had a large collection to offer from years of gathering glass from the Lake Erie shoreline, but it would be likely she would have to buy off the internet. She wasn't confident local providers would have the colors she was after. Many of them were her artist friends with their own projects involving beach glass. Grace studied him again carefully. How did he know about the rarity of certain colors? I have a few sources. She forced herself to look at him directly, heart pounding. If I can't find what I'm looking for locally, I'm certain I can find what I'll need on the internet. Ah, but that could be expensive. And besides, her interrogator glanced at Bryce. Didn't you say you wanted only local products in the design? Bryce Gallant looked startled for a moment, but quickly seized on the idea. Good observation, David. Although it may not look like it today, Gallon Enterprises is a neighborhood company started by my great-grandfather nearly a hundred years ago. We pride ourselves on keeping our business in the community, hiring local workers and supplies as much as possible. I want to make sure the chosen design reflects our philosophy. Well, I'm sure I can find enough local sources for the artwork. What about labor? The man, David, was persistent, his expression impossible to read. This is a big effort and must be completed by the grand opening in November. How do you propose to get all the mosaic work completed in such a short amount of time? You'll need skilled assistance. Will those also come from the community? Sweat beaded on her forehead. He had her there. There were only a few other skilled mosaic artists who were local and they were her competitors. They would be unlikely to assist her on the budget she had to offer. Grace had been planning to hire a few friends from art school who lived in New York City. I do plan to use art students at a local college, but as you pointed out, mosaic work does require skilled labor. 
I know several talented artists working out of New York City who could assist if I can't find the local talent. Also, I... Great questions, Jenkins, Bryce Gallon interrupted. This is why I like to have you attend these things. David chuckled, the sound grating on Grace's nerves. Happy to assist. Bryce Gallant rose from his chair and offered her a hand, indicating the interview was at an end. Grace, it was a pleasure talking to you. We'll be in touch after we have a chance to consider all of our options. Thank you for sharing your ideas with us. Grace had a sinking feeling she had lost the bid. What's more, she suspected the dark-haired David knew it, too. She squared her shoulders. When can I expect to hear from you, Mr. Gallant? We'll be in touch with you within a few days. Grace noticed the big man looked at David before responding, as if seeking his approval. Weird. Okay, she agreed, plastering on a smile. I look forward to hearing from you. There was nothing left to do but gather her materials, shake Bryce Gallant's hand in the hands of all the others, and hustle out the door. Although she kept her head high, in her mind it hung in shame. If she didn't get this job, she would have to call the bank again and beg for an extension on her mortgage payment. She might even have to move in with her mom and Glenn until she could get back on her feet. Well, that's that one. And so I'm just going to read a, a little excerpt from the other book, which is a sweet contemporary, totally different, written in the first person. So... So uh, just to set this up, because I'm not starting from chapter one with this one, um, Val works in, the heroine works in an office, and a new guy, a very good looking new guy has started, and she has um, just found out that he's going to get her promotion. So they just hired somebody off the street, and he's taken her promotion. And so this is uh, where the scene begins. I studied him again carefully. A shock of golden hair had fallen across his forehead right next to his baby blues. He seemed genuinely concerned and knowledgeable. You're not a merchandiser, are you? No. Despite my anger, I was intrigued. So what are you? I'm a consultant. I help companies like Reynolds who are experiencing slow growth in some of their main lines with a creative boost. So you being here, this is not a permanent position? They'd like it to be, but I only take on temporary assignments. I specialize in turnaround situations. Why? I couldn't fathom why anyone who needed to earn a living would accept temporary work. Reynolds hasn't made a profit the past three quarters. This has become a pattern. We need to fix it. No, why would you only accept temporary work? That doesn't make a lot of sense. What if you can't turn it around? Then you're out of a job. He shrugged. Somehow, maybe it was the ease with which he did it. The gesture seemed elegant. I get bored easily. I like a challenge. He looked me in the eyes, and I noticed that his had that chess playing spark in them again. He wasn't talking about just the consulting gig. His eyes said that I was a challenge too, one he would not back away from. My heart pounded and my alter ego came out to play. This, my dear, this is what you have been missing with George. Blood rushed to my cheeks. I refused to hold Charlie's gaze and the promise it contained. Instead, I looked ahead and resumed my furious pace to the restroom. Long legs kept up with me. I think you'll find Julie is quite a challenge, I said. She's the least of my worries. My, my, you have worries already and you've only been here a day. Welcome to the family. That was a figure of speech, of course. I don't spend a lot of time worrying. Well, then I take back what I said. You don't belong here. We only hire worriers. And what do you worry about? Keeping my job, paying my bills, George. Damn it, why did I have to go and bring him up? Of course, Charlie seized on that single syllable. You live alone, so George is your dog? Yes, I mean, no, he's my soon-to-be fiancé. How horrifying. He is a little doggish, isn't he? Comes when called, needs haircuts often. Stop it. Likes his stomach rubbed, a good eater. What's wrong with you? You have a fiancé? I nodded. Yes. Yes, I do. Well, I mean, we aren't technically engaged yet. We're saving for the ring. Ah, the ring. Yes, well, it's a beautiful ring. I mean, it was his grandmother's, but we need to pay for it to be resized, and we're updating the setting, which is taking a little longer than we would like. And what does your George do for a living? He owns his own business, I said proudly. He was still trying to get it off the ground, but it was a business. What kind of business? Well, George is Lebanese. He's been bottling and selling his Lebanese spices, you know, for cooking. They're quite good. George is a fantastic cook. We're having dinner tonight. 
He makes the best bubba ganoush I've ever tasted. Plus, his fatouche is to die for. I had reached the restroom. It was time to end the conversation and say goodbye. I don't mean to get too personal, but is George able to earn a living off the business? Well, of course. I mean, between that and his day job. He propped himself against the wall outside the restroom like it was the most comfortable pose in the world. And that would be? George works in his family's business. Chef? No, listen, I got to use the restroom. Talk later. He reached one long arm out and snagged mine before I could push the bathroom door open. No, sorry, he said. You can't leave me with a burning question like that in the back of my mind. Where might your Lebanese soon-to-be fiancé, who is not a chef but cooks you meals and concocts spices, which as I think about it, he must do from his home at night since he has a day job. Where does he work? Hearing Charlie describe George was a bit overwhelming. He's a, a barber. Somehow it didn't sound as impressive coming out as it did in my head. I see. How exactly did you meet George? Don't answer him. Don't. Oh, the usual way. He watched me carefully, his blue eyes gleaming with intelligence and laughter. What he found funny was beyond me. George was not a funny topic. Let me guess. You needed a haircut and George gave you a trim. Of course not. What would I be doing in a barber shop? True. Hmm. So you met him in a bar? George likes to party? No. A grocery store or laundromat? Please. Aha. It just came to me. George was picking up his dry cleaning. You came in to pick up yours and noticed that some of his shirts still had ring around the collar. You pointed it out and suggested a home remedy. George was intrigued and asked if you could show him how you make it. He invited you to his family barber shop. You showed up, cleaned his dirty shirts. He invited you to taste his spices and the rest is history. Boy, this guy did have a good imagination. No wonder he was hired to provide a creative solution to our sales slump. I couldn't help but crack a smile. Wrong. You met over coffee? Mm-mm. Am I warm? Lukewarm. So it was over food. Of course, George was at his favorite Lebanese joint, scoping the place out for future ownership when in walks his dream girl. He looks at you with his big brown puppy dog eyes and tells you to try the hummus. Then he tells you that he supplied the spices in the hummus and the rest is history. You and George are getting married. You fell in love over Lebanese food. The weight of Al's heart is through her stomach. I couldn't stop the giggle from forming and escaping from my lips. He was funny as well as cute and smart. I was in real trouble. I reminded myself again why I didn't like charmers, why I had sought out a man like George, a good, hardworking man who wouldn't flirt with other women or tell funny jokes or lie between his teeth or sleep with my roommate. What is this, 20 questions? Enough already. I need to use the restroom. So I'm right. You and George bonded over food. I'd had enough. I pushed the door open and went inside where I would be safe. But charming Charlie wasn't done. As the door shut behind me, I heard him say, does George give out doggy bags? Thank you. Can you all hear me? You guys can hear me. So I'm not muted, but the rest of you are. Oh, no. <laughs> Is it something I did? Shall I entertain while you guys are waiting to unmute? Okay, let me do my best to entertain. So let me tell you about this book, what inspired this story, uh, as you may have gathered from me reading it, there was uh, talk of beach glass. I am an avid beach glass collector. Um, I collect it from the Lake Erie shoreline where it is just seems like that's the best place to gather glass. And while I was on the beach one day, my husband has a jet ski. He likes to drop me off in different places on the beach. And while I was on the beach one day, 
looking for glass. Nobody else was around. I started to get a creepy feeling like, what if somebody were watching me on the beach? And so, oh, and so I, I got that creepy feeling and I uh, was wondering about that. And I, I started to think to myself, well, what if my mind just went, you know, this is a mind. And I thought, what if somebody were watching me on the beach? And what if somebody were watching someone on the beach, I should say, and they had no idea and they could read their mind, what would happen next? And that was the spark that uh, got me started on this book. So this book is a series. It's meant to be a series. Mind Waves is the first book. Cross Waves is the next and so on. Um, but it was all inspired by gathering beach glass on, on the Lake Erie shoreline. And then Charm by Charlie, totally different book, very lighthearted, as you could tell, very funny. It's meant to, it was actually inspired by Gilmore Girls, if you know that show. I love Gilmore Girls, one of my favorite shows. And um, so it's very quirky like that with a lot of quirky characters, a lot of craziness happening, very fast paced. Um, so I, I don't know because <laughs> I don't run this show normally. I don't know if I should keep talking or if we're going to get this fixed as to why uh, as to why uh, only I can speak right now. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions that's listening online right now about any anything uh, to do with the books or. There, I'm back. Oh, Am I back? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened. Let me take them out and back in again and maybe, oh, oh. you know what? It unmuted. I don't know what happened. That's really <laughs> weird. Well, you got to hold your, you got to hear from me for longer. <laughs> you did a great job, Amanda. I don't know what happened. I kept clicking on the little um, thing and it would not unmute us. So. <laughs> All right, we appear to be back, um, back in business. Good job, Amanda. Yes. <laughs> Way to carry the show. <laughs> Way to carry it. <laughs> well, and that's why we use this program is because we are not technical people, so we we you know rely on this technology to to do that for us. So I don't know what happened, but I enjoyed both of your excerpts. I did. Um, it was good that it was muted because I was over here like. <laughs> <laughs> great that's awesome we had to mute you don because i think in the past we we weren't smart enough to mute ourselves even though we were not on the screen and we did laugh and then nobody knows where the noise is coming from so so we did have one question karen says what year um was your first book published uh mind waste came out and i <laughs> I have a very interesting publication story, but Mind Waste came out in October of 2016. This book is published with the Wild Rose Press. And then this book came out um, very shortly after this one by Burroughs Publishing Group. And this came out in April of 2017. So and Amanda, I started with the Wild Rose Press too. No kidding. Uh, um, yeah. Well, I really like them, but you know, yeah. I, I didn't realize things would happen quite as fast as they did, honestly. Yeah. Um, and you learn a lot in this business yeah. uh, from publishing, you know, sort of, I, I kind of wish I would have uh, held on to my books a little longer and wrote more because now I'm in the position of, I can't write fast enough is really where I'm at. Yeah, um, for real. So I mentioned working on three, you know, several projects at the same mm -hmm. time. That's why I do that because um, I'm trying to write as fast as I can really. Yeah. Are you, are you going to still write for the Wild Rose Press? Uh, this is a series with them. So okay. yeah, so um, hopefully we can get the other books out with Wild Rose and then my critique uh, partner writes for them and loves them. Yeah, they're, I, I they're too. Um, but I, I just pulled my books from them just because my agent, she suggested it to, to put it on my back list because I would I am actually I made like uh, a thousand times more money. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're a small. So, you know, yeah, they're small, but like I never got any book bubs or any of that until I self published it. Yeah, um, I love working with Nan though. Like Nan was my editor, and I love. Yeah, I recognize that name. Mine is Laura yeah. Kelly is my editor. Yeah. Wild Rose. She's yeah. very good, but. Yeah. So are both of those series? Linda wanted to know. It sounds like the. Yeah. The no, mind this, games. Is, this is a standalone. So let me okay. tell you, uh, if you don't mind, I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, this ahead. is a standalone book. And mm -hmm. um, the, the story I mentioned that I'm working on is another standalone story. It's called Sweet Stuff. And it, my books are all set in Cleveland because that's where I'm from. You know, 
the characters may go other places in the books, but I, I generally they're set in Cleveland. And so, um, so I'm writing something similar in this style. Romantic comedy is very popular right now. So I thought that that was a good choice to work on. Um, and I really enjoy writing kind of humorously. Um, and so sweet stuff I'm very excited about because the one that I said I was about halfway uh, through because um, it is the story of uh, a woman who owns a bakery and a movie star, a weary, uh, kind of a jaded movie star who ends up coming to Cleveland and buys her building and is going to open. It's an historic building and he's going to open a fitness chain called Fitaholics in her bakery and she's not happy about it so it's just a great story she has such a good heart she's feeding the homeless out of her uh store and he has been so used and abused in hollywood and i just can't wait for that to to finish and be able to do something fun with it so that's that's funny so jennifer wants to know when you think the second book will be published the in this series this one from the first book i'm so this is a series book. I'm hoping, so that book is in edits, developmental edits, actually. So I have a lot of work to do on the second book, even though it's fully written, which is part of why I've set it aside and been working on something that's a little easier. It's very hard. This is a very crazy world <laughs> that I have here. Mind hacking, you know, hackers go in, uh, they guard the nation's intellectual property and they're hacking into people's minds, which I thought was total fantasy. But as it turns out, it's actually real. Um, there's technology that is allowing people to harness your brainwaves right now. So I get, I know that because I have the title. <laughs> well, of my husband's not watching this. Just so yes. you know. People get scared actually reading this book and they think it's real. I made it up. I didn't know any of that, but it's actually, there is hacking. <laughs> That's the future that we have to look forward to, but, but with technology. Uh -oh. Yeah. My, this book is all, you know, about the paranormal. So they have psychic abilities that allow them to do it, but. So you have a fight now with the FBI, right? So I'm sorry. <laughs> I, have, I have a file on you now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? I actually work in cybersecurity. That's my day job. So Ooh, okay. That's where that nice. kind of inspiration also, yeah. I think, comes from. But good questions. Thanks for the questions. I once took a weapon off an FBI agent. Really? <laughs> yeah. Was he sleeping? No. <laughs> yeah, really not. <laughs> Sorry, Don. You know I love you. He was the dumbest FBI agent in the FBI. <laughs> the FBI. <laughs> no, I was. Uh, we we had the, this uh, Secretary of Homeland Defense coming to the base for our change of command, and uh, the Secret Service gave me instructions to take all the weapons off every law enforcement agent that comes on the base. So they're all coming. I'm talking Secret Service. Uh, the Secret Service was the only one allowed to have weapons. They didn't want everybody pulling their weapons at the same time if something happened. So we got FBI, CIA, um, like all local law enforcement marshals. They're all coming on the base. And I, w my job was to ask them, do you have a weapon? And then if they had a weapon, to take it and bring it to the armory. And the armory had to watch it during the change of command. And... Um, Everybody said no. I mean, I could see the outline of their weapon on their ankles and their under their jackets, but I'm not going to be like, Mr. FBI agent, I see your weapon, you know, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so this one guy comes up with two other FBI agents and they say, hey, gentlemen, do you have any, any weapons on you? And this one little nerdy guy says, yeah, I got a weapon. And I'm like, I'm going to have to take that from you. <laughs> His two buddies look at him like, you're an idiot. <laughs> and he was the only one that we had to, the only guy that we had to watch their weapon. Oh, funny. Oh, so you didn't like take him out or no, knock him down? Him out. Okay. He was a, it had to be like a, like one of those, like. I was a little worried that you were about to give up like national security secrets yeah. or something. Well, I, I, I was going to have to find a new co-host because <laughs> you were going to be in the slammer. <laughs> <laughs> all right well we still need to hear from sharon so i'm kind of afraid to mute us though <laughs> um so i will put i will put sharon up by herself but then the the other two like we need to be quiet while she's reading okay all right can, all right. can you do that dawn i'll try okay all right, so Sharon, why don't you tell us what you're reading from and give us a little setup and... Okay. 
Sounds good. And I will be, I'm reading from um, Every Deep Desire. It's the first book in the Deadly Force series. I'm not sure if you can see it, the glare. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, looks from yeah. Source Books. It came out last March. Um, the second book was supposed to come out this January, but it's been moved um, for a variety of reasons to next to this coming September. And then book three will come out pretty soon after that. That's the one I'm actually finishing up this week. And then there's a novella in there. I'm not sure when that one's coming out. Um, I will be offering two signed paperback copies to U.S. citizens um, um, of this book. So I'm very excited. My publisher um, has given me a couple, a couple to give away. So, um, pardon me? Oh, sorry. So I will be reading from this book. I will be reading the prologue and then the first, the scene where they first meet. And I'm gonna, I'll give you a little bit of a setup. Um, you see how thick this book is? It is over 500 pages. Um, hours of entertainment. Hours of entertainment, yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a little bit of setup though before I, I start reading so you're not confused because the, the first meet is not in the first chapter like many, many romance novels. I think it's in chapter my editor won it in chapter three. I think it ended up being in chapter four. Anyway, takes place in Savannah, Georgia. My husband is from Charleston. I'm from New Jersey. When I first met him when I was 16 in the deep South, I just fell in love with those cities. And, um, and so I decided to set these books there. Um, it is about a, actually, this is a reunion story. It is a married couple. Mm -hmm. um, they actually are divorced, even though he doesn't really consider himself divorced. They have been separated for eight years. What she doesn't realize is that he he was a Green Beret and he disappeared. Actually, he and she believes he went AWOL. What she doesn't realize is that he went to work for an ancient army of assassins called the Fiona, which actually existed um, in early, early days of Ireland before the Romans even invaded. But in this, in this whole series, they exist now as arms dealers, but they're also brutal assassins. And they require a tie from every man who serves under them, which is um, they have to give up what's most important to them in the whole world. Uh, and he gets roped into joining them, but th that's not that important. So I'm going to read the prologue where she's a newly married woman and she discovers her. Well, I'll, I'll let you find out what she discovers. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, the second scene that I'll go right into is Juliet. Is, it's eight years later. She has become a landscape architect. She's working in Savannah to renovate an old um, garden square that they're known for. And what her husband doesn't realize is that she's also been a stripper on the side because when he left her, she was desperately poor. So she has had to literally hack her way into the life that she has built for herself. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a couple names of the people just so you don't get confused because they're mentioned in that chapter and I can't take them out without it even being more confusing. Um, Bob is her workman. Pops is Rafe's father. Aeschylus is another assassin. Um, and Deke is the man who runs the strip club. The prince is the man who's in charge of the Fiona assassins, um, who Aeschylus and Rafe both work for. And the Fiona assassins, what separates them out from just like regular mercenaries is they, um, they bow before killing and they only speak in Shakespearean verse because the original Fianna warriors um, around the time of the Romans only spoke from the seven books of Gaelic poetry. It was a mark of self-discipline to have memorized every word, the entire language, and wow. only speak from those words. Um, it's very cool. I had never heard of them until I no. started researching them. And so, but in my books, they speak from, Shakespeare, from all of the works of Shakespeare. So they have an old fashioned style of language. And anyway, they skulk around, they're very scary but Juliet knows nothing of this. So I'll just go ahead and start reading. And then if anybody has any questions afterwards, I'm happy to answer them. All right, we're gonna okay, put right. it up there. So it's all you. And we're okay. gonna be quiet, but not muted. That's okay. I'm gonna to try to look at the camera, but it's hard for me to read and look at the camera at the same time. Juliet's daddy had always told her to stay away from men who bowed. But tonight, as she struggled with her groceries in the snow, she almost asked the stranger in the shadows across the street for help. He bowed as she walked by, and as creepy as that seemed, she was reconsidering her daddy's warning. It was still Valentine's Day, after all. She blinked against the freezing wind, and the man had disappeared. She made it to her apartment and almost stepped on the ivory envelope. Balancing her bags in one arm, she picked it up. From its weight and polished paper, a letter instead of a bill. A Valentine, maybe? 
from Rafe. Flurry, Flurry's blue as she unlocked the door, five months apart, five months since their argument, five months and they finally sent her an apology. The ache in her heart loosened and she went inside. Frigid mildew-tinged air blasted her and her breath came out in cold white gusts. The heat was off again. She placed the bags on the counter and turned the envelope over. The linen stationery felt thick and expensive. Someone had sealed it with a wax stamp of a sword pierced in the heart and written her name and script on the other side. It wasn't Rafe's familiar or regular printing. After trading her coat for her favorite sweater, she curled up on the couch. Her husband was undercover with his A-team. Had someone else sent the letter on his behalf? It wouldn't be the first time Rafe had broken rules. Still, five months wasn't the longest they'd gone without contact. Last year, he'd been away for eight, except that this goodbye had been different. They'd argued, said things she prayed they hadn't meant and hadn't made love before he'd left, something that had never happened before. She held the letter to her heart and looked at the unpacked boxes stacked around her. Rafe had left the week they'd moved from Fort Bragg temporary housing into this apartment, days after his mother's funeral. She'd refused to unpack completely because without him, it didn't feel like home. Worry and lack of sleep had left her exhausted. Nightmares plagued her nights, dreams she'd had since childhood that only Rafe's touch could heal. For the past few weeks, she'd been obsessed with a heavy feeling in her heart she could only define as doom. She broke the seal and read. The back of her throat burned, her sweaty hands gripped the edges of the stationery tearing it, and she read the letter again. It wasn't a valentine. No, 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 no. She fell off the couch and crawled to the bathroom. She barely made it before the eruption hit. Minutes later, she rinsed her mouth and leaned her forehead against the window. The room smelled like vomit, bleach, and mold. It reeked of betrayal. Outside, the moon hung full like on the night he'd left. Another wave of nausea drove her to her knees. She rolled into a ball, her um, arms tucked in close. He wasn't dead. He just wasn't coming home, ever. The doorbell rang and she ignored it. She lay there for minutes or hours or days when even the moon turned in and she shifted onto her back and stared at the stained ceiling. The brown concentric circles reminded her of constellations. The star patterns she and Rafe identified together out on the aisle when they were kids. Pegasus. She raised one arm to reach the sky. The winged horse constellation had been her favorite, only visible a few weeks every year. She'd always dreamed of flying away from the aisle, her father, her poverty. But instead of reaching for the stars, she'd married the man she'd adored since she was four and he was eight. When the doorbell rang again and again and again, she got up, determined to send whoever the hell it was away. She flung open the door to find two army and keys in full uniform, wearing pistols, standing side by side. Their grim faces shared identical hard angles. Cold air burst into the room, chilling her even more. Mrs. Montfort, the first MP asked. Yes. Ma'am, the second MP held out a pair of handcuffs. You'll need to come with us. So this is eight years later. And she's in her garden, um, the garden that she's redesigning right now. Juliet took off her hard hat, threw it onto a newly installed iron bench. The man looking for her could have been anyone. That hot panicky sensation returned, making her hands and legs tingle. Despite the sunshine, thunder clapped in the distance again. She gripped the edge of the table and stared at the invoice until the image blurred. She didn't hate Rafe. She just had no reason to see him again. Their marriage had been a youthful mistake she put behind her. Voices sounded from near the Pegasus fountain, and she looked up. Bob and the water inspector were arguing again. Sighing, she slipped her phone in her pocket and went toward them, and stopped. A man over six feet tall had come through the privacy fence and strode towards the fountain. She paused, not just because he wore combat boots, low-riding jeans, and a black t-shirt that outlined his ridged stomach, wide shoulders, and tattooed arms. Not just because he reminded her of Michelangelo's marble male stat studi studies exhibit that, she'd left, that had left her with pudding knees. Not just because he carried the aura of carved masculine perfection with ease. She paused because his gait stole her breath. Elegant, even graceful, he moved with a determined purpose wrapped in fluid weightlessness. She wouldn't call it eerie so much as powerful. It had to take enormous strength and self-control to move a body as large and muscular as his so beautifully. He spoke to Bob, who pointed towards her. The man shrugged, nodded, took off his leather bike jacket he carried, and turned. Oh God, his long stride ate up the plank walkway while she wiped her palms on her dress and inhaled deeply. In the space of her exhale, he stopped a few feet away. His brown-eyed gaze clasped onto hers with a longing that kept her still. 
His sheer size, the yearning in his eyes flooded her with a kind of heat that cooled low. He was larger than she remembered. The way he studied her like she was the only thing in this world worth noticing reminded her of everything they'd been to each other, everything they'd once had in that forever and always kind of way, which ended up being a total lie. She had to remember that. She swallowed. Hello, Rafe. Seriously, the man had abandoned and betrayed her, and that's all she could say. She couldn't even keep the tremor out of her voice. Juliet. It sounded like a prayer, and her breath hitched in the back of her throat. After eight years, she still remembered how her name resonated on his lips, how the word ended with a soft drawl instead of a sharp consonant. She blinked while he took her hands and moved in, brushed a kiss on her cheek, and his familiar musky scent teased her nose. She closed her eyes and her eyelids burned. It was like the anger and sadness and disappointment that had lived inside her for so long were so deeply buried they couldn't find their way out. She could only stand there, feel his lips on her face, and remember what used to be. Part of her, the traitorous part that exhaled when the kiss ended, was even relieved that he was still alive. For a few of the eight years he'd been away, she hadn't been sure. Could she be even more pathetic? Probably not, because she considered the possibility that if she kept her eyes shut, time wouldn't only stop, it would swing back to the last hours they'd spent together, the last moment they'd been happy. What is wrong with me? She opened her eyes and used her fingers to wipe her cheeks. Her, guard, her gaze started around to her work table, the fountain over her shoulder, his dusty boots until landing on the blue ribbon wrapped around his wrist under his sleeve jacket, his jacket sleeve. She was over him. So why was this so hard? What was it about him that made her tremble, made her limbs feel heavy? He should be angry and dismissive. Yet all she could do was ask, what are you doing here? There were so many other questions loaded into that one. Why did you leave me? Where did you go? What were you doing? Do your tattoos mean what you said they mean? The prickly feeling rushed through her again and she fisted her hands until her nails cut her palms. His relentless gaze shone with unapologetic, determ unapologetic determination, a trait she remembered. The army released me from prison. Oh, for God's sakes, why? She hadn't meant to screech and had, in fact, never screeched before, but as Flinch testified to her pitch and tone, she took the stray hair between her ear and shook her head. Embarrassment sent a flush from her neck to her face. The army dropped the charges and let me go. His voice was low and melodic. He even reached out to touch the strand that wouldn't stay put and hung over her forehead, except she turned until he lowered his hand. I know seeing me must be unsettling. Unsettling. Yes, that was a word she could support. She took two deep, breath, two deep breaths before meeting the heat in his eyes. I thought you had a life sentence, or was that a lie too? She shoved his hands in his front pockets. Despite his jacket, the movement only emphasized the width of, the width of his muscle chest. He was so much bigger than when he'd left. One day I was in solitary confinement, the next I was free. She frowned. The whole thing sounded really sketchy. Do you know why or who orchestrated it? No. She studied the handsome face she used to cup with her hands and caress at will. Square jaw framed by firm cheekbones and deep brown eyes, shorn hair with slashes for eyebrows, lips that protected white teeth, one with a small chip from the time he fell out of the tree next to her balcony. The same face she once loved now had tiny lines around the eyes, a jagged scar on the forehead, a darkness in his eyes. So, you just came home. Stayed still under her visual assault as if daring her to look at all of him, as if daring her to see the man who had supposedly gone AWOL to work for a gun-running mercenary, as if daring her to ask the question they both knew she wanted to ask but was too afraid to. Yes. He spoke softly, his words edged with steel. I came home. With his obvious physical strength and don't screw with me or I'll kill you attitude, he seemed capable of working for an arms dealer. Heck, he could even be an arms dealer. Yet he had kept a polite distance between them and moved slightly so the shadow he cast kept the sun out of her eyes. Then there was his upper body, which shook as if the act of standing still in a garden talking to her required a tremendous amount of self-control. Frustrated with her all over the place emotions, she tucked that damn stray hair back again and walked towards the fountain. He fell and sat next to her. She said, when are you leaving? Depends. The way that word rolled off his tongue, heavy and intense, loaded it with all sorts of meanings. Depends on what? On you. She stopped near Bob and faced Rafe. You nuked my life, yet your decision depends on me? Yes. For the first time, his attention shifted from her to the horse rising out of the fountain four feet away. Pegasus? Memories of their childhood were evident in his half-smile. Our winged horse? She shrugged. If she wanted to play the deflection game, she would too. No matter what he said or did, she wasn't going to allow him to mess up her life again. 
She was no longer the wounded bird he'd married. Classical architecture is still around. Timeless beauty always trumps dead war heroes. When he turned to her again, his stare took in her clunky, steel-toed garden clogs and her pink linen dress up to her hard hat must hair. It does indeed. She pressed her palms against her skirt. What do you want? No question mark, a direct statement requiring a direct answer. His eyes narrowed. To see you. Why? Her question sounded desperate, but she didn't care. It's been eight years. He ran a head over, hand over his head and glanced away. Because it's been eight years and I need to make sure you're okay. I sent our divorce papers to Leavenworth. She grabbed his leather clad arm and forced him to look at her. We're not married anymore. I am not your wife. Juliet. His voice was so broken she almost couldn't hear the words. No matter what the world says, and regardless of what you believe, you'll always be my wife. So your safety always trumps everything. Thunder hit hard, much closer this time, and she wrapped her arms around herself. What does that even mean? I'm here to protect you, and I'm not leaving until I do. Do you want me to keep reading? I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> We're actually, I mean, it's like 8.56, so well. 9.56 for you guys. I forget the three of yeah. you are, are staying up late. It's still. Um, so good. I mean, I want you to keep reading, yes, but I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I can read Rafe's reaction scene if you want. It'll probably take like two minutes. It's up to you guys. That's, that's fine with me. Okay. I'll read quickly. Okay. okay. Well, don't read too fast or we won't be able to enjoy it. <laughs> All right, we'll put you back up there. Okay. All set? Yep. Okay. Rafe's vision narrowed on his wife in a pink dress and adorable clogs, her hair twisted up with tendrils framing her face. Even with her arms crossed and her spitfire brown-eyed glare, she appeared delicate, graceful, perfect, everything he remembered. Was this what it felt like to die from regret? His heart burning from the inside out and ache in his arms from staying still when all he wanted was to pull her against his chest? What do you mean by protecting me, she demanded. Since he'd left Pops' trailer with no plan or thoughts about what he was going to say or do, all he could offer was, I was worried. Why? I thought, he ran a hand over his head again, grateful for that, that none of his Fiona brothers or any of his buddies from his ex-A team were watching. He could barely put two words together. You might be in trouble. Rafe, I've built a life for myself without you and I can take care of myself. She waved an arm to indicate the garden square that he remembered as a parking garage. I am okay. More than okay. You're beautiful. He paused. Oh, good Lord. Could he be more lame? A flush turned her cheeks pink and she pursed her lips, a sure sign of a rising anger and eventual retreat. Hell, this wasn't going well, which is probably why the prince had forbidden Rafe from ever seeing her again. He felt a raindrop and glanced up at the darkening sky. He'd missed the storms that rolled in from the aisle, the ionized air that cleared the humidity, the city's moldy stench eclipsed by the tang of wet pavement, the static charged breeze. Since they had at least 15 minutes before the storm hit and Juliet stared at him like he had horns on his head, he motioned to the iron bench wrapped in plastic beneath an oak tree. Can we sit? She turned toward the fountain. He followed her gaze and the warmth of hope loosened the tightness in his gut. Yes, he'd screwed up his life beyond repair. Yes, he may have broken his tithe to the prince and put her in more danger by coming home for no good reason. Yes, she had every reason to hate him and not speak to him. But from the moment he'd seen Pegasus, the winged horse from the constellation that used to follow in the Isle's summer skies, he wondered if maybe there was a way to repair what he destroyed. And if not fixed, atoned for, maybe that would both bring them some closure. Maybe that would both bring them some peace. Her rapid breathing, rising breaths in a rhythm, rhythmic pattern proved she wasn't as immune to him as she pretended. After he used his hands to wipe her seat clean, she sat with her, with her hands clasped in her lap, looking at everything other than him while he lowered himself next to her. Her lavender scent slammed into him and he held back a groan. Not happy with the way his lower half responded, he leaned forward until his forearms cut into his thighs. Has anything weird happened lately? Weird how? Has anyone been following you or harassed you? No. She blew away the strand of hair that kept falling forward. I've had some vandalism at my shop, but the city is seeing an uptick in low-level crimes and drug use. Has anyone broken into your apartment? From the pots of gardenias, lavenders, and roses, he seen on a balcony, he'd seen on a balcony over her shop. He figured she'd lived above her store. She'd always loved those flowers. She'd even carried them in her wedding bouquet. No. She glanced at him with a furrowed brow and questioning eyes. Have you seen Pops yet? 
Yes, staying with him for a while. Good. She slipped her hands between her clenched knees, the action pulling down the fabric of her dress and lowering the neckline a quarter of an inch. It wasn't much, but it was enough to make his sweat burn his skin. I hope he was happy to see you, she said. As opposed to her? Rafe studied her face with her down gaze, downcast gaze, tight lips that were turning white, and high cheekbones that seemed more prominent, probably due to her weight loss. Yes, he'd noticed that too. She'd lost at least 10 pounds since he'd left her. Pops didn't throw me out. She nodded. So why do you think you have to save me? Because um, as I'm sure you've noticed, I can take care of myself. Yes, she'd said that for a few times now. He also knew it wasn't completely true. Helly understood her better than anyone. When faced with conflict, she retreated into herself, afraid to rely on another. Her fear of trusting anyone, especially him with her heart, had been the greatest source of conflict in their marriage. Then again, she had good reasons not to trust people. Her mother had died in childbirth. Her father had neglected her. The aisle turned against her. Rafe had abandoned and betrayed her. The rationalization that he destroyed her to save her only worked on mornings when a bullet through the head seemed more inviting than the morning sun. I believe someone I worked for is following you or at least keeping track of you. She squinted at him. The arm sealer you left your 18 for? That was the rumor she believed. Although it wasn't true, it would work for now. Where did you hear that? doesn't matter. She sighed and her shoulders slumped. Why would this person care about me? Because he believes you're important to me. Am I? She asked softly, her eyes filled with other questions he knew he couldn't answer. Am I important to you? Always and forever. She stood suddenly, her hands tucking her hair, her hair behind both ears. How long has this been keeping track of me going on? He stood and made sure to keep at least a foot of space between them. He didn't trust himself any closer. I don't know. Does it have anything to do with your release? Maybe. Is there anything you can tell me for sure, like why you left, what you've been doing for the past eight years, why you came back? The pain in her voice sent an ache deep in his heart, into his heart. All of this hurt was his fault, and he had no idea how to fix it. The only thing he did know was that telling her the truth would get them both killed. Mm. Thank you. So we nice. do have a question. Um, oh, awesome. Deanna wants to know what inspired Wraith in your story. Who inspired Wraith? Um, do you know, I was actually inspired by Juliet first, and I was writing her, and then Rafe just appeared. Appeared, so I don't know what inspired him. I had been I had been working on a YA novel for my agent, and I'd been studying the Fiona because at the time YA dystopians were really popular, and I was thinking about using it for that. And when Rafe appeared on the screen, and he told me he was a Fiona warrior, well, that's really odd. Like I had always thought of it in this whole other sense, and it just as I started writing the book, he just Bless, it just he just came alive to me so sorry it's not I don't actually have an inspiration for him he's um he's a dark character mm -hmm. he has a wonderful character arc and he is redeemed but he's done some not great stuff when he when the book opens yeah has the past and he's been in prison he's been in a Russian prison he's been in a U.S. prison oh. he has been an assassin you know so he's done some things yeah but when you find out why he did those things, you realize the torment he's actually, the emotional torment he's been suffering under. So, and this book is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. It sounds uh, really good. But, but they don't all die in the end. They don't all die in the end. <laughs> don't Spoiler! All, there, is mass, there is like destruction. Um, my, editor made, my editor made me take a lot of it out, but um, there is destruction and there is, you know, a big explosive ending. But no, everybody's happy at the end. It does it redeems, it redeems the emotions. It's as if, as my editor said, it's as if the prologue, the end of the prologue, where she's alone, that's that's the metaphorical death. Mm -hmm. of both it's the death of their marriage. And then, so, Catherine also asked a question to everybody: um, Have we? Do we get to meet our cover models? And I. <laughs> No. I mean, I've, I've never met my cover models per se. I have done book signings with some cover models, but not mine. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm married to one of mine because if mother, <laughs> my husband is one of my cover models, but oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> he might be again. I'm not sure yet. We'll see. No, that's a good question. I, I've never gotten to meet any of my cover models. No, I wish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That'd yeah, I haven't either. You haven't either. Someday, maybe someday. Yeah, I was say, maybe something to dream about. <laughs> yeah. 
I was going to ask um, Sharon, how do you research being an assassin and being yeah. in Russian prison? Other than watching really a lot, I mean, I watch crime shows all the time. I love CIA movies. Well, a couple things. One is, my, my real job um, is a librarian. So I'm a reference librarian. Oh. I've been a reference okay. librarian my whole adult life. But I'm also married. My husband was an army was an army officer for a long time. For many okay. Years, and now works for the Department of Defense. So when I have questions, I actually ask yeah. him, and he goes yep. and asks yeah. his friends what would be. And um, this first book actually went to the um, to the um, public affairs office at the Pentagon. Yeah. Who works there. And they read through it, and I made three changes for them. And wow. So the second book is there right now. I, I, no, sorry. Yeah, the second book is there right now, and then the draft of the third book. Um, the Army's funny. They're not like. Yeah. <laughs> they are funny because they don't seem to have a huge sense of humor they to don't. me. <laughs> they don't. And, you know, there are Navy SEALs everywhere in the fiction yeah. world. There are very, very few Army books. They're yeah. not yeah. Like, really I hadn't funny. thought about that. Yeah. Um, My um. I was wondering that because you were talking about Fort Bragg, right? So mm -hmm. my, my father-in-law is actually Delta, and um, he was at Fort Bragg for a while in, over in Tacoma and stuff. Did you live in Fort Bragg? No, no, no. We lived um, we lived at Fort Dix, and then okay. my husband stationed a couple of different but came down. I was going to you said you were a Jersey girl. Um, I, I'm actually... My house is going up for sale in a in a week or two. Um, Cape May. Oh, we lived there yeah. for a year. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I actually grew up in northern the northern part of the state, but I, when we lived at Fort Dix, we went to Cape May. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. It was really beautiful. So it's very nice. Though I have questions that I don't want to search on the internet for, just because mm -hmm. they're a little squirrely. Um, I do have people who are willing to answer them for me. Yeah. And I did. I and, and I've had a lot of. Um, They've given me some really great feedback. Yeah. So well, my my husband's Coast Guard. I still go through the PAs there, yeah. the public affairs officers, with them too, just to make sure. And they're really wonderful. They don't mind. They really are. That's why, like, my husband's a cover model, but I couldn't show his face. Oh. Right. So, like, active duty, you can't show their faces. Right. Um, right. So I have I have a, a Coast Guard series coming out boot camp because my husband was a drill instructor. Um. So. I did a boot camp book and um, I have that coming out at the end of the, the year. And I've got all these coasties who are like, I'll be your cover model. No. And, <laughs> and I'm like, I can't show your face. Right. right <laughs> okay. yeah. Not that you're not handsome. Right. <laughs> That's so funny. So, yeah. We do have a couple of questions real quick. Um, Mindy wants to know while researching info for a story, have you ever set off any red flags? I'm sure every author has. Yes, I know I have. Have they come to your door? Um, <laughs> many, many years ago, my husband called me from work and said, what are you doing? Oh. <laughs> I was researching. He's like, I think you should get off the internet. Yeah. After that, I just, if I have questions, I just send them to him. Yeah. Yikes. Okay. Gosh, I always told my husband, just ignore my Google history. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Maybe I need to go to the library to do my research from now on. <laughs> and then Karen wants to know, do you have second thoughts on the name of a character after it goes to press? I never have. Have you, Amanda? Uh, I'm trying to think. Not really after it goes to press. I've had second thoughts in the writing. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things is not picking names that are so similar, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a big issue for me, too, is not picking names too similar. Um, but no, I haven't. My editor has very um, strong opinions on names too. So I have changed them for her. Really? Yes. yes I have changed names for her. Again, it's part of the whole similarity thing. And yep. she, well, she, um, Dylan, I didn't know, don't know if you got this little lecture, but heroes have one syllable names. No. Yes. No, I did not know that either. Um, villains have two to three syllable names and then like side characters and stuff can have like two to four syllable names i have never yeah. heard that, that i've never heard that either who's your yeah. editor yeah do you work with okay i was gonna say do you work with deb I work with, um yeah. i have not heard that who do you work so, with? who do you mary oh okay 
Maybe that's a um, death thing. It could be just a death thing. It might be. Because, yeah, otherwise I would have been in trouble because my my book that comes out with source books, Cowboy Charming, that comes out in July, the hero there is Presley. Um, yeah. Mm. So it could although, he's, he's kind of the villain too, because he's oh. the playboy. But yeah, I don't know. Well, it could be the genre too. Maybe yeah, could be. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I had never heard that before. Mm -hmm. I find my names by like researching popular names. Well, for my historicals, like when they would have been born, and then. Yep. You know, Cheryl and Kenyon put out a, a character name book many, many years ago. I think it's still available in used bookstores. It's like a dictionary. And oh, I haven't seen that. Oh, it's wonderful. It's got a because it's got really great indexes in it, so hmm. you can go through and look for like one syllable name, two syllable names, names mm -hmm. from different cultures, names from different periods of history, different years. Um, and then it, it it's a really great book. It's called I think it's called naming your characters or character names, but it's by Sherilyn. Okay. Author, so. I buy baby name books at garage sales. Oh, I love those. <laughs> yeah, like at the used bookstore. And I was so mad because I had, you know, like five of them when I was having kids and then I gave them all away. And then I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I have like four or five baby name books on my shelf right now that I had to go rebuy because I gave them away. I have to something with Karen real quick. So Karen, uh, you, you should be okay. Um, I had a, I did that kind of contest at one point. Um, she's saying she won a giveaway naming rights to a secondary character. So she was oh. Curious. Oh. Um, I, I did a, a giveaway like that before. And Salissa, she's actually um, a friend of mine. Um, she's a Coasties spouse too. She won the rights to name my, one of my main characters. Huh. So, um, one of my Coasty books, she's, uh, she named one of them. It was such, such a cute story. I love Celissa for this. She, oh, she lost a baby. And so her son is now the hero in my book. Oh. And so it's like, I love it. <laughs> I would never. It's really sweet. That. That's it's sweet. It's really, really sweet. Yeah. So you should be okay, Karen. She, Typically, if you win those, they, they keep your name. So does anybody have any other questions? I know we went over, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was. So I told you, like, it gets out of, I mean, we, we lose track, track of time. We do lose track of time. Yeah. Um, so Sharon is giving away two signed paperbacks of her yeah. book. And Amanda is giving away a copy of each of the books in ebook that she read from tonight. So our um, giveaway post, I pinned it to the top of the Romance Happy Hour Facebook page. And we'll leave that open for another 48 hours or so. So everybody has a chance to get in on that. I know now that you've heard it, you want to. Um, and I noticed people have been signing up for the newsletter, which is wonderful. Um, but if they're not getting the confirmation emails, they've been taking... Like instead of coming immediately, sometimes they're taking like an hour or longer. I don't know why. Oh, that's weird. So if I think the entire internet has been wonky lately. Oh, I know. Have I you know. noticed that the whole Facebook yeah. thing? I was a little worried that we weren't gonna be able to to have our show tonight because everything was maybe so bizarre maybe yesterday. Like, maybe that's one of those like um, Amanda, those like cyber attacks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cyber yeah. attacks like brain. Amanda's mind hacking Facebook and Instagram, I think is what it is. Internet, because we're all sitting here going, work, work, work. We're really doing all these things in our brain. We're going to get brainwashed and turn into one of those sci-fi movies. Yeah, well, focus your attention on bringing spring to the upper Midwest. Would you, Dawn, if you're going to use that energy for something positive? Okay, all right. Good idea. I'll, I'll tell all the... the um, the, the government workers over there are trying to control our brains to control the weather instead. There you go. <laughs> if you ask my brother, there's like some kind of um, thing in Alaska, like facility in Alaska that actually controls the weather. Oh, I've heard that conspiracy theory before. I'm always looking for them because you can turn them into great stories. Like right. this is for novella, mm -hmm. romantic suspense. Right. And I'm sure for with Amanda doing all the paranormal stuff, they make 
great <laughs> stories. I mean, it's possible. We, my husband and I were hunting out in the middle of nowhere once in Alaska, and we, we came upon this, like, really, I think it was to the uh, the oil thing that goes, like, the, the oil pipeline or whatever. I think it was to, like, that. But it was, like, just this bunker, like, this door to a bunker. So I'm like, ooh, maybe this is, like, some underground, like. <laughs> and you didn't go down there? No, I wanted to though. It was instead of this government property. So, what if you were running from a bear? I think they would have followed me down there. <laughs> and I've talked about bears in Alaska multiple times. So <laughs> she had me all freaked out because we have a cabin in northern Minnesota now, and now I'm paranoid that I'm going to run into a bear and I need oh, bear spray. I have. <laughs> I ran into a bear. Yeah. Oh, uh oh! On and Gatlinburg and Gatlinburg, Tennessee. If you oh, go yes. there, you'll really? see bears. Oh yeah, it climbed our cabin. I have, I yeah. have video, <laughs> and you can hear me yelling, screaming in the background. <laughs> oh my very, gosh! Very frightening. We used to send my. We had bear. We lived in the Bear Superhighway in Alaska in Valdez, and um, but we used to send our kids out. You just you just wear a bear bell. A bear bell. <laughs> <laughs> There's two kinds of people in Alaska, right? There's the that that live there. There's the kind that think that bear bells will 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 um work for everything, and then there was the kind that wear their shotguns downtown. I mean, it's not abnormal to watch somebody go into the store with a shotgun, and yeah, because they're just walking around downtown. So we kind of met in the middle and carried bear spray everywhere, but we sent our kids out with bear bells and they never got attacked. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there was such a thing. I didn't either. You didn't tell me that I need to just pick up some bear bells when I go <laughs> up to the cabin. They hear you. They'll run away. Unless okay. they're angry mothers and you're in between them and their cubs, then they'll attack you. You'll probably die. But well, or unless you're Amanda trying to mind your own business in a cabin and they just well, to scale the walls. I, I had two boys eating barbecue on the. the oh, yeah, that was good. that's what yeah. attracted the bear and the bear will climb to get the barbecue. Yeah, I <laughs> can imagine. Wow. Yeah, it was wow. frightening. Well, I'll have to maybe not make so much fun of my mom now because we stayed at a cabin up in um, it was Sevierville. At, out by Gatlinburg and she said she went out one morning and she's like there was a bear just walking down the street like mom it was probably a large dog no you know? they do they walk down the street that that wasn't the only bear we encountered but that really was, oh that we were teasing her <laughs> we were yeah. teasing her I'm like I'm sure it was a bear mom like how how big was the bear mom and yeah so no, now I feel kind of bad bear. go apologize to your mother <laughs> might have to and here Linda is talking about, you know, grizzly bears. I mean, I'm sure she's oh. as much as they do in, in Alaska, Miss, Miss Canada. Yeah, Catherine said she had a bear encounter too. Yeah. We've got some, some wild readers that join us. Oh, you do? <laughs> you know, well behaved women rarely make history, right? That's right. <laughs> All of our readers are freaking awesome. That's right. Oh, funny. <laughs> Well, I am going to go ahead and to let you guys go to bed because I know it's it's later where you are. But I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight yeah. and for everyone that's watching. And yeah. we will um, get this up on the YouTube channel and the website. And we always open for another couple of days so people can have a chance to enter. And then on the 28th, March 28th, we'll be having uh, Abigail Sharp and Barbara Longley will be joining us. Next. Oh, I know Abigail. Yeah, wonderful. And I know Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a very large small knit community, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and I were once authors. <laughs> so it was really fun chatting with both of you and Thank both you. of your everything you read tonight. I just got totally sucked in, so I'm looking forward yeah. to. I mean, to it's learning more. twenty minutes past the hour. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. For and I was having just you. talking about how we're so considerate of their time and normally end right away. So, <laughs> so there goes that. A lot of theories were blown to bits tonight, Don. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank, All right, well, thank, thank you much. very much. And we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.